Go ahead. Yeah. It's recording. Well, that's good. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Banana. Is it really good? Welcome. Uh, welcome to the 8th of April, if that seems possible. It doesn't hardly seem possible to me. And our last lecture. The way we're going to split this up is I'm going to kind of wrap up any of the little bits of content that we've got prepared for you. And then Dr. Jacobs is going to talk to you about, as I did last time, about some of her research, how it intersects with lots of the themes we talked in the course and how it might intersect with you and the kinds of career decisions and that you have kind of immediately and in the long term because, uh, yeah, storytelling and learning. So here we go. Such as they are, these are some of the content-based learning outcomes. So again, talking about the relationship between structure and function in this unit as it relates to physiology and in this unit as it relates to Arctic physiology. And thinking about the relationship between biological levels of organization, so organism, population, organ, uh, molecular, and physiological adaptations to temperature, so acute and chronic and evolutionary. Uh, uh, and then I think one of the marching orders, I suppose, if there are such a thing for you guys, is to remember to continue to think about these things in your career, whether it's as a doctor or a lawyer or a bus driver, in terms of thinking what's happening to global biodiversity in the context of climate change, because uh, it's not good. So one of the last, uh, there's kind of two, two examples of things today um, that we'll talk about today, uh, changes at a molecular and cellular level and changes at, a, at an organ level. And the molecular and cellular level adaptations to living in low temperatures um, involve this, a homo viscous adaptation. And remember, we're talking about when we use this term as we're using it as a physiologist right now. So in the sense, we're using it uh, not as an evolutionary biologist. But this is a term that perhaps you've run into before, but it basically is going to, re it makes reference to the boundary, the cell wall of all of the cells that make up us, that membrane phospholipid layer, and how there's a different way to compose that membrane in a cold versus a temperate or tropical environment. Now you've seen or drawn or constructed out of different Legos or or different things, um, these kinds of phospholipids. I'm sure before earlier in your academic career at high school and at elementary school, or maybe even here. I'm not sure. But the top layer, these saturated fatty acids with a non long parallel nonpolar tail that have no double bonds. This is the characteristic layer, cell wall layer, and probably one that uh, you have drawn out now. It's not a great adaptation at low temperatures or at high pressures. And that's because it becomes too rigid. And you want uh, fluidity in most of the cell walls for most of the cells that then comprise different organs. You need some degree of, of, um, of fluidity, of mobility. And that's why in many Arctic or deep sea abyssal organisms, uh, or both organisms that are both, we see the cell wall comprised of these unsaturated hydrocarbon tails that have these characteristic kinks. And those kinks mean that they have, they confirm mobility at lower temperatures, cold temperatures, or at high pressures. So this is a phospholipid saturation equals fluidity at low temperatures equals an example of a molecular cellular um, adaptation to a cold or an extreme environment. Now, we have some other examples at the functional level, and they involve penguins. So I show this penguin jumping in uh, to this boat because it's just jumped into this example, and then <laughs> back to the water, you silly thing. These are Australians. And it happens a lot more often than you might think. <laughs> with Australians? Uh, no, with, with penguins. Yeah. <laughs> So the question uh, in terms of a function flowing from structure question would be, as is posed here, if this little penguin wanting to science with these Arctic or Antarctic uh, explorers would want to conduct science, um, 
that little bird, she's much more able to do it while standing in bare feet on this ice pack than any of those Arctic uh, primate researchers are. And so why is that? The human in bare feet would not last long if she was standing on ice, but the penguin can last a long time. Why? Well, the answer is for a bunch of reasons. It's because um, they actually wear shoes. Oh, little known fact. <laughs> tiny, yes, the adaptation, tiny Antarctic cobblers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> oh. oh, it's the last day. <laughs> yeah. So this is part of the reason uh, that they can do it. This is, uh, in a sense, they're cobbling. They cobble together this adaptation that we call regional heterothermy. So, and it, we see it in lots of uh, polar animals, polar mammals. So flukes and flippers and whales and seals and walrus and the legs of wading birds and in other even uh, vertebrates that stand on the ice and expect to stand there for a long period of time. We made mention of this, I think, maybe in passing when we were talking about the Ray Romano, the, the mammoths. Um, mm -hmm. But this is a counter current exchange system. So here, so counter current exchange, you might've run into again in your, in your past academic, academic training. And what's being passed here aren't um, solutes or salts or anything, but heat. And so the arterial blood flow shown there in red is hot, it's leaving the core of the body, heading out boosh, into the distal parts, like those very, very cold, cold, cold feet. The venous flow in blue is wrapped around, this is one of the functional adaptations, is wrapped around that hot arterial flow. And so what that provides to the bird or the caribou or the wolf is a gradual warming up of the blood as it returns to the core, meaning that it won't result in a big problem, uh, the stopping or, or the alteration of homeostasis and the, the, that standard standardized um, internal environmental condition that endotherms are dependent upon. We have a tiny video here from a circulatory cuddle. And I don't think there's enough physiology textbooks that use that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who's venous and who's arterial? I don't know, uh, who's hotter? <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy question. So looking at countercurrent exchange here, and we, we use that term regional uh, heterotherm here, and I think that's shown best in this image in the center, the blow up of the gull's leg, where you can see close to the body, 32 degrees Celsius, the, that constant internal temperature that's needed. But as you go, if you were to measure in tiny increments down the leg, you can see that it drops and it's much more, it's maintained at a, a level that's still above zero, but much more close or what much closer to what the water or the ice that they're standing in or on would be. So the solution, as this says, arteries give up heat to the veins, blood going to the extremity, so it's pre-cooled, little heat is lost. So it's kind of an elegant solution. So we've got a molecular adaptation, a organal uh, veins and arteries adaptation. And so thinking about these kinds of things, thinking about population levels, remember we talked with way back, way back uh, in a different world in the first evolution unit where we talked about levels of biological organization. Um, we've got organ systems here. We've got molecular systems. We've got organisms and populations. And the challenge that we've got for you now you see this is a spoiler alert i suppose but we filled this in for you thinking about as we reflect on what degree on the left hand side the rows of this so molecular cellular tissue organism population what level the emperor penguin um, possesses these adaptations to deal with polar environments arctic antarctic environments and then across the columns here are the, the scales of physiological change or physiological adaptations that we've talked about, the acute, the chronic, and the evolutionary, loosely related to time and heritability, of course. So, uh, so we've talked about some of these today with the molecular and the countercurrent exchange. There is a whole bunch of... I would put the countercurrent exchange in a different spot Where now. would you put it? I would put it in... Maybe it depends on whether or not. Again? Yeah. It depends again. It depends on whether it's always in use or just chronically in use. Mm, that's interesting. It can be acutely in use. Uh, uh, so, what you see Dr. Jacobs going through right now, Dr. Jacobs, who wrote this slide, <laughs> is something that you can now go through. We've suggested with the polar bear that this is a thing that you can take away and think about those biological levels of organization and think about adaptations that they have at different physiological levels uh, to live in a polar environment. We've suggested the polar bear. There's no need to stop uh, if you want to think about Antarctic ice fish or 
the Arctic Hare or the Mammoth or the any of the other Arctic things, maybe Costa Rican beetles. Um, think about... <laughs> Why would they think that? <laughs> high, high elevation Costa Rican beetles. You can think about that. Um, so these are kind of some worksheets that you can think about. And and again, this is we, like we talked about when we were all together in that uh, Rosansky room. This is an example of, of you kind of marshalling the facts and integrating and synthesizing and then fighting with them and thinking, well, I thought it was here initially, but now I think it depends. And it could be in both of these cases or both of these boxes. Um, yeah. And that's an invitation for you to keep thinking about those things, not just in the context of the exam that we're all going to do together, but the, your life as a scientist. Now, speaking of life as a scientist, trade. Trade. Okay. There we go. I need to use PowerPoint like this so that so you can clever. still see the captions, but um, you can see my PowerPoint slides because they wouldn't import for some reason. There we go. Okay, cool. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I like to think about. Um, and uh, then I'm going to give you some unsolicited career advice because we get a lot of questions about career advice or academic advice, like what you should be studying and that kind of deal. So I have opinions and I'm going to share them with you. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> and it certainly doesn't mean that you can't get in touch in the future, but um, we get a lot of some similar questions. So we thought we'd take the opportunity to, to share some sort of fundamentals with you. Okay, moving on. So I'm going to play this while I talk. Um, I have been to a lot of places and I have been to a lot of places <laughs> wearing very different hats, uh, just depending upon, you know, where I was and what the context was. Um, and so this globe here shows you uh, pretty much most of the places that I have sailed on ships of various sizes, although I realize now that this should go up further along the coast here of South kind of America. A huge amount of latitude too. It really is. So from about 82 degrees north to about uh, 67 degrees south. It's um, most of the degrees of latitude. Yeah, because it, why 67? Because once you get to 67, you hit land. And I've been on the beaches, but I haven't been inland in, in Antarctica yet. And one of the things we all know is sailors, it's is, hard to sail on the ice. It's hard to sail on the ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I've done a lot of sailing. Um, and the video, um, some of the footage here, that's from the Discovery Channel's Mighty Ships, uh, where I was the expedition leader on board this ship. Um, in like recently, like a couple years ago, um, my son was on this trip. Dr. Smith was on this trip. Um, they were there on holiday and I was working um, and it was great. Uh, and so I moonlight still as an expedition leader, but um, Dr. Dr. Smith wasn't on holiday. He was on watching. The he was on watching the, the baby. <laughs> Yeah. He was bothering. Um, he was bothering, yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so uh, I've been going back and forth basically between sort of the expedition logistics side as well as the professing side of things. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why and how all of that. Um, but basically, what, um, what I do now with respect to my research is I do a lot of things. It's kind of all over the place. Um, and it is deliberately all over the place. One of the reasons why is so that I can support a greater diversity of students, both uh, academic diversity, um, but also other diversity metrics that we use. Um, and uh, this was taken a couple of years ago. My lab is getting even more and more diverse, which is really great. So um, I actually, as of yesterday, became a professor also in the Department of Management. Did you know that? <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. It turns out that, yeah, anyway, super funny. Um, and so because my research is so interdisciplinary, uh, I'm able to do that. So now I have students that are doing theses in conservation and business management, things like this, which I think is kind of cool. So shout out to all of my students um, who are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I have 
three areas of research that I do, um, and it is deliberately uh, done this way, basically to increase my own research resilience. Um, imagine, for example, you're, you're doing this research, you're super focused, um, you're like the uber expert in that area, and then all of a sudden research priorities change for the government and you can't get a grant to save your life, right? Okay, so this is what I thought would be a really good idea to prevent um, from happening to me. So I have three areas of research. One of them is uh, in seabird biology. The other is in post-secondary and higher education. And the other is in something called biomimetics. I'm going to only tell you about seabird and foraging ecology because it relates specifically to, um, to this particular topic in this particular course. So seabird foraging ecology and mate choice. I'm not going to tell you about mate choice, but oh my God, is that stuff ever cool? Why do birds choose the mates that they choose? Like messed up really good. Um, but I am going to tell you about the foraging ecology stuff. So um, I study the marine environment. And to me, I find it fascinating because the marine environment is kind of like the great equalizer of the planet, right? Um, it's, it's, its conditions are kind of spread out around the world. And what's going on in one part of the marine environment affects, you know, a completely different area much further away. And it kind of creates like a, like a buffer kind of um, a, like a temperate filter for all of the terrestrial environments as well. Now, this guy over here will argue that the terrestrial environment is cool, um, and he'll say that actually not much is known about the terrestrial environment. I would say that we pretty much know everything about the terrestrial environment. We know nothing, Jon Snow. But we know nothing about the marine environment. We know nothing, Jon Snow. Both of us are right. It just depends on your, your scale, right, your perspective. Okay, so this is where I study, and I spend a lot of time studying biological systems uh, in order to understand what's going on um, at an environmental scale, like a large environmental global scale, okay? Um, in order to do that, um, you can study abiotic factors. If you want to know about, you know, environmental change, you can study abiotic factors like uh, temperature and precipitation, uh, or you can study biological factors or biotic factors, right? Um, and uh, this guy over here focuses entirely on abiotic and uh, would say that, you know, temperature is the most important predictor of biological diversity. And I would say, pshaw, only if you study ectotherms. And he would say, well, <laughs> that's kind of all the, the average animal is an ectotherm. And I would say, but endotherms. Um, and so, you know, for, for Smith, uh, a couple of degrees Celsius change can have a dramatic influence on uh, the organisms that he studies. A couple of degrees Celsius change for a puffin or a sea lion, different type of effect, right? This just means the sun has come up a little higher. In a the little sky. higher in the sky, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what can all of these things tell us is, is essentially what my research program is about, all of them being important. So basically, this is kind of how I like to think about things. If there's any kind of environmental change along this y-axis from a little environmental change to a big environmental change, the little environmental change is most likely to affect the ectotherms, right? Um, because of their physiology and because of their, their natural history. Um, a moderate amount of environmental change will then affect one trophic level higher. Uh, and then a big amount of environmental change may start to influence even a, tr a trophic level higher to the, to the top predators, the apex predators, right? That's kind of how the model goes. Of course, it's not that easy, um, but let's just get started there. Within that sort of hierarchy of effect of environmental change, we can break it down within each one uh, and relate them to specifically sort of different biological indicators associated with that species or with that trophic level. Um, the idea here is that um, for a small amount of environmental change within that um, sort of range of environmental change at the lower end, you might anticipate changes in things like self-maintenance behaviors, right? So for example, um, a bird may spend less time preening itself and more time looking for food if there's a little bit of environmental change where it disrupts their ability to get fish or it moves the fish a little bit further away, right? 
if there's a moderate environmental change um, for, uh, for any one of these, uh, then you would expect that to affect reproduction. Um, so for example, um, a bird that would normally have five eggs may only lay three eggs. Uh, cormorants do this all the time when the fish aren't as readily available. Um, and then a large amount of environmental change within the relative uh, trophic level. Um, you would anticipate there to be um, changes in adult survival, right? Where individuals are dying. That's a pretty dramatic way of signaling that the environment is changing. Um, and so, and, and this like, no one's published, this is just off the top of my head. This is what I think uh, based on my experience and based on what I've read about environmental monitoring systems. Um, and I think it's important to kind of understand that there is the potential for this kind of hierarchy of signals um, and uh, to try to start to work it out. Except you put it all together and it looks beautiful, right, with our different m measures. So here, for example, we might look at um, you know, timing of, of uh, spawning here. We might look at total numbers of offspring here. We might look at, you know, fish population size, um, <coughs> you know, that kind of deal. We may look here at, um, at mate choice. We may look here at number of eggs. We may look here at total population size again for the puffins. And if there are any changes at these levels, we can then sort of transfer it onto our Y axis and go, well, that represents a lot of change or eh, the environment isn't changing that much. <coughs> Super satisfying, right? Um, so this is the Jacobs model, which I'm about to bust open because you collect data and you realize that it's not that simple and not that satisfying because things can jump from one uh, level to another. So what's a little change for one level may be a huge problem for another, depending upon the biology of the species that you're talking about. So I go and I measure the depth at which fish are caught by different birds. Okay, so here's the prey species of the fish, right? This is capelin, uh, this is the salmon, this is a herring, right? Um, and uh, you can see the different depths that these fish were at when they were caught by birds, because I put little computers on their legs and I know how deep they're diving, right? So this capelin, for example, or this group of capelin was caught at about four meters, right? This sand lance, or all of these sand lance, are found a little bit deeper down in, in the water column. So we could say, okay, fine. So if, for example, you know, the fish, because of uh, warming surface temperature of the water, actually kind of resettle to deeper temperatures, that's probably not a big deal for the fish, right? Especially if they're eating, you know, things that are readily available at that depth, that wouldn't be a big deal at all. Okay, cool. Except for the birds, this could be disastrous. If all of the fish go to deeper depths, so on the, on the y-axis here, the depth would be deeper, would be up, right? Um, go to deeper depths, the birds may physiologically not be able to catch them there anymore because they can't dive that deeply. So going from something that would be just a fine scale, you know, change here for the, for the fish could all bring you next step to an absolutely catastrophic event, right? With a mass dying out of birds. It depends on the biology of the things that are in each of these categories. So basically the reality is my model looks like this, like my toddler took it apart and threw it on the floor, right? Um, but understanding the theory behind it and the idea that there would be these potentially hierarchical responses is kind of cool and, and it does make sense, at least within the trophic level. But once you start jumping from one to another, then everything basically goes out the window, depending upon the, the specific biology of the species. So this is where I focus most of my work, um, spending most of my time uh, in Arctic places because there are no insects, not really, um, and certainly no insects that bite uh, or lay things in you. Um, but uh, also because it's it's a fascinating um, you know system within work, which to work. Would I be happy studying something else? Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and it just so happens that the people that I work with uh, and the people who I love working with are working with seabirds. 
Um, so what I do is I spend a lot of time studying what fish they're bringing back uh, to their uh, to their chicks and what they're actually eating. Um, I've just finished a study actually with this guy here who has some skills in barcoding, where we were barcoding poop of birds to find out if what they are feeding their chicks, which we can visually identify just by looking at what they've got in their bills, uh, is the same thing as what they're feeding themselves. Um, and because we don't actually see the adults eating, we don't know what they're eating. So I thought it would be cool to barcode their poop. Um, and for this one species that we did it on, uh, it turns out that they are eating the same thing as their chick. And that's important to note. Um, and so we can basically monitor now chick food to identify whether there's a big change in the availability of food. If we didn't know that they eat the same things, then we might think that chick food isn't going to be the good indicator for change over time, right? So it's really important to know that. And Justine, the lead author of this study, is a former 1070 student. Yeah. <laughs> I, I meet a lot of students through 1070. You know, it's really good. More. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's one of my field sites in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, where there are many, many seabird species um, in the same place. And this to me is really important because um, seabirds, uh, the different species dive to different depths. They forage at different distances to the colony. Um, and if you remember that um, slide that we showed you about the, the penguins and the different foraging ranges from Antarctica, where some were like super shallow divers and some were really deep divers, if you take these six species and you map them out over the ocean, they cover all of the ocean up to 100 kilometers away from the colony. So by studying all of them together, we get way better picture of what's going on in the environment. And it's not actually me that's doing all of this. Of course, it's my students who are amazing. Um, here are two. This is Sydney, who started her first field season on Middleton Island with me um, immediately after she finished 1070. So right out of first year. Like within hours. Like within hours, yeah. I needed somebody to go really quickly. Um, and she was ready. And um, I knew who she was. And so I wrote her an email and said, can you please spend five months in Alaska? And she said yes, and then it was done. Um, she actually did three field seasons for her honors degree, and she's now doing a PhD um, at Memorial University with my mentor, Bill Montevecchi, uh, who's amazing. Um, and uh, she's very happy, and he's very happy because she has so many skills. Uh, she was able to skip over her master's and go right into her PhD after leaving my lab. So for context, three field seasons for an honors thesis is roughly equivalent to what she'll probably get in her PhD. Yeah. So she'll come out of this at the end as Dr. Collins with six field seasons, which is amazing. amazing. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is Josh. He looks grumpy, but he's not a grumpy person. <laughs> it's just, I think, two o'clock in the morning when we took that photo. <laughs> Um, and uh, Josh uh, did his master's with me recently and went also to Newfoundland. For some reason, my students end up in Newfoundland. Justine is in Newfoundland um, and uh, Rachel is in, like four or five of them have concentrated in Newfoundland, which I'm happy with because I love going there. <coughs> um, but Josh got a full-time permanent job with Department of Fisheries and Oceans as a wildlife uh, biologist. So yay, out of his master's, which is pretty darn impressive. I'm really happy. Okay, moving on. So this is kind of summarizing basically what uh, what we do, the data that I collect. These are the little computers that we put on their legs um, and we monitor their diving profiles. Uh, this is a chick and we measure uh, chick growth rates, for example, as an indicator of how well they're being fed. And then, of course, we look at the fish that they're feeding uh, because one fish, this capelin, is not the same as this fish here in terms of caloric value. Um, but some birds can only bring back one fish at a time. Uh, so by looking at the types of fish that they bring back, we can get an indication of what's going on. We measure their growth because it has implications for that. And we measure how they're going and hunting for their food. So all sorts of different measurements. And we have found some things. Some of the things we found is that it depends on how old you are um, and how you dive. So different birds dive at different efficiencies depending upon how old they are. And this is important to know then if we're studying old birds versus young birds. 
what else? We have found variation in the toxicity levels of eggs depending upon where the birds were foraging at the time that they were collecting the energy necessary to make their eggs. Um, so we can use this in a couple of ways. <coughs> We can use this to identify marine environments that are important for birds and in terms of a conservation um, uh, effort. Uh, or we can use it in order to start tracing back the different sources of organochlorines or different sort of toxic components um, in order to identify their source. Uh, we have found things like rhinoceros auklets are amazing indicators of environmental change because they are generalists. It means that they eat whatever is there. Uh, so if whatever is there changes, then it will be reflected in some of the things that we measure about their biology. Um, and we have found differences in the chick diets as well. Um, so don't get overwhelmed by this. Uh, too much, uh, except for to say that basically if the shape changes, then the alpha diversity of um, what they're eating is changing, the types of species as well as the number of species. Um, so if the shape is large, like open like this, it means that there's more species that they're eating. In this case, it would be sand lance and capelin plus a few other things. Um, and here, really, the only thing that that um, chick was eating for those two weeks is going to be capelin. What we can see is that these shapes change over uh, the age of the chick, uh, as well as from year to year, which means that there have been fluctuations in the alpha diversity of the prey species that the birds have been feeding. We can also look at these data in a bit of a different way um, by just looking at the percent composition of of the um, diets that the chicks are being fed. Um, and basically what I hope you can see without, without worrying about the details too much is that there's a lot of gray in these three years, but not so much in these three years. And basically what it means is that capelin uh, was quite dominant in the diets of, uh, of the birds for the first three years of this data set, but that there was a major change um, and that in two of those years, it was sable fish that was replacing, uh, largely replacing um, the capelin. Um, and so we can use that as a kind of indicator of what's going on in the marine world to say, oh, we better worry a little bit about the capelin um, because the sable fish may be taking over, right? That kind of deal. Um, and we can compare the data that we get from our biological systems to the technological systems. So here, for example, um, is uh, the Gulf of Alaska a map uh, where the data were collected using nets from big trawling ships. Okay, and they looked at uh, the here we just have the concentration of or the number of sand lance. Um, that they were catching uh, throughout these different areas. So you can see that here there's quite a bit of sand lands. Here there's a lot in red. If we focus on Middleton Island, which is this area right here where I do my work, you can see that the data are showing that there are no sand lands in this area. Except for when I take a look at what my birds are eating, Here's Middleton Island and sort of this, this box here is represented by, you know, more or less this box here. Middleton Island is right here and both the red and the yellow tracks from my foraging data were of birds who caught sand lance. So sand lance is there because birds fish where the fish are. And I think that's the thing that I've discovered in my whole career. <laughs> kind of like a no duh kind of thing, right? Birds are going to be foraging where there are fish, so we should be studying the birds. Um, oh, and if there are no birds, then there are no fish. But if there are traces of former colonies, then we can use that as an indicator uh, that there used to be fish there, which gives us tons of forensic ability to be able to construct um, different population profiles of marine health. Okay. Um, a few more minutes uh, remaining, and so uh, we'll talk a little bit about careers and career paths. Um, this is not me, but this certainly looked like me when I was about seven years old, kind of dreaming about what it is that I wanted to do in the world uh, with my time. And um, 
one of the things that brought me to where I am is that when I was seven, I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. Got to show the picture. Oh, yeah. Um, when I was seven, I wanted to be a marine biologist. And it really just bothered me when um, other kids changed their minds. <laughs> So I dug in and I was just like, marine biologist, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I would say that that's probably not the best strategy. Um, because instead of thinking about it, like in terms of like a career title, um, I would picture your career and you in your career um, more along the lines with you know, what does my daily work life actually look like, right? Um, yeah, so this is me when I was four, my very first dive. Um, and uh, it pretty much set my passion right from the beginning that I was going to do more of this, you know, deep water exploration, stuff like that. Now, I don't do deep water exploration, but I do do a lot of diving. Um, and uh, and it's, it's fabulous. But, you know, would I be happy being a terrestrial ecologist? Absolutely, because there are so many interesting questions and so many interesting people and, and systems to work in. So instead of kind of saying, I'm going to be a dentist, um, think a little bit about what your work day is looking like. You know, is it flexible? Is it different every day? Is it predictable? Um, is it super social and collaborative? Is it individual and personal? That kind of deal, because there are a lot of different job titles that we can't we didn't even know exist, right? If we asked you right now to list off all of the jobs that you could think of, you would get to maybe 50 or 60 and that would be a good list. But there are hundreds and thousands of job titles. I had no idea that somebody could be an expedition leader, for example, okay? Um, and it turns out that that's what I became when I finished my PhD. So I did field work in the Arctic for my PhD. I collected data. I was on these like, you know, these science expeditions with like four or five people. We were living um, in these luxurious conditions. There were some years where they were not nearly as luxurious, but this cabin was so comfy compared to where we were living before in little tents um, and certainly much better at protecting us from polar bears than the little tents that we had. Um, but one of the skills that I had as a result of finishing up my PhD, which was my defense was an absolute disaster. Um, and I'm still here. I didn't, I didn't fail it. It's because I was being examined by all old white men. Uh, so basically I was being examined by one person uh, and they did not like me. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Anyway, I, it was so bad that I got a letter of apology from the Dean <laughs> anyway, but I survived. Um, you wrote about it and I wrote about it. Yeah. Right. We, we'll put the link up if you want to read about my, um, my absolutely disastrous defense. Um, yeah. So, um, I lived in that little cabin for quite a while and did some stuff and I had some skills that weren't necessarily academic. Um, and so I, and because of my defense experience, I was like, screw this. I'm not meant for academia. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm an imposter. I hate these old white men. Um, and, and I left essentially. Um, and where I ended up was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> because I answered an ad that my mother told me I needed to answer uh, in a small newspaper for an expedition company um, and uh, got hired on the phone by the president of the company, um, not because I had a PhD, but because I had experience in traveling in the Arctic um, and because I was bubbly and happy. <laughs> Those were the reasons. It had nothing to do with my credentials. Um, but I started out as a sailor uh, fixing Zodiac boats um, and painting. I, I did a lot of, of painting of the sides of ships as it was sailing by amazing places in Antarctica. I even worked as a, as a bartender on one of these for a little while too, which was not a good job. Um, and then I moved up to being a guide uh, and then eventually the expedition leader for the company. And, and that from the time that I was a deck sailor to the time that I was an expedition leader was maybe three years, maybe two and a half. Like it's a high turnover kind of a, kind of a business. 
Um, but I got to see some amazing places. So, so this ship is uh, in the background is Antarctica. Um, and uh, same here, uh, also an Antarctic landscape, just to kind of give you an idea. We don't always get to see photos of it. So there you go. Um, obviously, I got to hang out quite a bit also in the Arctic, uh, as well as everything in between sailing the Panama Canal uh, guiding. And it's not it's not like you have to, you know, do it basically voluntarily. At the time that I was doing it, we were getting paid some like serious money um, to be doing the jobs that we were doing. Um, it was uh, it was really good. Um, and yeah, lots of close encounters with all sorts of really great wildlife. And that was, that was great for, for quite a long time. Um, until my mother said to me, when are you going to get a real job? My very Jewish mother, um, who was looking, you know, for things to be able to talk to her friends about that her kids had accomplished. Um, and both of my parents, uh, are now retired professors. So like one upping them is going to be really hard. Um, but, uh, but then I thought, okay, well, it's no big deal. I can get a real job anytime because I have this PhD and this career like possibility. Right. Um, and so at, you know, in 2012, when I decided I'm too old for this, um, and I need to get a real job, I did. Um, I got hired at Guelph on a Skype call. <laughs> and again, not really because of my credentials, more to do with like, you know, bubbly collaborative. I, I brought a big grant to the school too, which was helpful. So, um, so all of that was good, but I didn't get the grant because of my credentials. I got it because I was bubbly in person and had a personality. Um, and uh, I came to Guelph uh, thinking, yep, yeah, no worries. I've got a PhD. I can fall back on this. But as I started working at Guelph, I realized that I don't use anything from my PhD or my master's or my my honors, that everything that I use now uh, in order to teach and to do research came from those you know six or seven years that I was sailing and traveling. Um, all of the teamwork, collaboration, learning how to you know inspire people and then you know support them to be further inspirational. Um, all of those sort of foundational skills that we don't actually teach in school are the ones that have been the most important to me, right? Yep, it's, and it's 100% the same for me. Yeah. I, I had to put myself through university working on rivers, uh, guiding and, and teaching people to, to paddle whitewater, which is amazing, and I, I loved it. And he's being Intensely. really modest. So this guy used to be like the head instructor of a kayaking school where he was teaching instructors how to be instructors. He's really good. But <laughs> it's a, these are life skills that I use yeah. day to day now in my job in a much more regular fashion than anything I did my PhD on. Yeah, because we can Google our PhDs and read them if we want. Because we published them. <laughs> Because we wrote about known. them. It's known. It's a Dothraki. Yeah. Um, but but all of the things that are really important are the things that are unique to you and the way that you kind of build them together. So I think if I was going to say one thing of advice is it doesn't matter what your skills are. The most important thing is to be hyper aware of what your skill set is, right? It doesn't matter what superpower a superhero has because they're going to know how to use it best right in different yeah. situations and so you need to know how to use your superpowers and your combination of skills to get to the next step and the one thing that i think i've done quite successfully is that when somebody tells me no i go really you know let's not let's not talk about whether i can or can't do something let's talk about how i might be able to get to that spot that i need to get to um, and, you know, if you're willing to compromise on time or pathway, um, then you can pretty much get to, to wherever you need to be. And also realize that if you, you don't have to look back and go, oh, shit, when I didn't do a field course in second year, that means I can't follow this path. Of course, it does not at all. And maybe the things you picked up along the way are going to be real strengths and you getting to this newly identified career goal. Yeah. So how does that play into what's going on now? Well, what's going on now has been a major disruption in your lives. Mm. 
you are worried about your future plans, you're worried about whether or not you're going to be able to get into med school, you're worried about whether or not you're going to be able to, you know, do that course or get into this opportunity, you're worried about whether you're going to get your summer job, right? What I can tell you is that you will figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, you need to ask for help because it will be okay for most of you. Um, for some of you, you will need some extra help. And, and if you need um, any kind of help figuring out how, we're happy to put you into contact with the right people. Um, but there is no clear single pathway these days to any of the goals. Uh, and I think that that's the thing that I learned in my 20s the most is that the path is never straight. The Facebook presentation of somebody's path is always straight, right? But the reality is that yep. it's like all over the place. Yep. And being all over the place can be actually a really big positive. Yep. Um, and you can use that to your advantage, right? It doesn't mean that you've, that you've failed in any way. So we hope that was helpful. Yep. If you need any more help, let us know. Mm -hmm. um, we want to say thank you to all of you for what was the most interesting semester we will ever experience, I hope. <laughs> Unless next year is <laughs> like it too. Um, thank you for sticking with us. Um, you'll all do great on your final exam. Um, and uh, and uh, we just want to say thank you for everything. Yeah. You uh, expect kindness. You warrant it and give kindness because others deserve it. Yeah, okay, bye.